Good morning. I'm so glad to be with you guys today. There's the ladies. I can see some of you. I see that uncommon glow in the room. I just want to take a minute to thank Pastor Marco, Pastor Lisa, for inviting me, for allowing me to share this pulpit, for trusting me with you guys. As a pastor myself, I know that's a big deal. And, um, and so I'm just, just very, very honored. I, I'm senior pastor of Journey Church in McAllen, Texas. My husband pastors with me. We own a sign business. He's home taking care. We have five children. I think they have a picture up here somewhere. We have five children. We just got another child, a son-in-law, and our son just got engaged to a young lady, so I'm going to be adding the daughter. Yeah, There they are. Look at that. Good-looking people. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. I have five children, four sons, right? I, I am a beautiful daughter that traveled with me. She's sitting here on the front row. I am married to a Puerto Rican, and I am a Texan, so that means I am blessed and I have attitude. It means that you cannot scare me for anything. Come at me after service. I'll be like this, catch me outside, how about that? But I didn't come on my own. I came being sent by our church. Our church uh, is a new church plant in Texas, McAllen, down by the Mexican border. And we have been supporting you guys and loving on you guys since we kind of reconnected uh, with family. And we... Uh, I came bearing gifts, Pastor Marco, and I didn't bring a gift for this first service. I had to bring one for the second service, too. So in the first service, we wanted to give towards your foster home for those that are growing out of the foster system. This service, we are giving you $1,000 because we want to support the African work you're doing in Africa. And and I want to give this to you on behalf of Journey Church. I'm going to place this. Let me just give it to you now because I don't want to. Um, and I, I'm, we're doing that purposely. We're sowing seed. We love you guys. We love what you're doing. I mean, I, I could jump into all of this. If we lived closer, I'd be here all the time. I'm not joking. But I just wanted to say thank you. God bless you. And I just continue to do the work you're doing. We, we partner with you because we believe that God wants to change this world and that we can do something about that too. Amen. So I was telling them in the women's conference that, you know, we were living in a very strange time where everybody is, is believing crazy things. You can think what you want. If you wake up and identify with this, it's like, I identify as what? I don't know. I'm a millionaire. Let me in this restaurant. And they're like, no, you can't even pay for the bread, which is free, right? And so we're living in crazy times. And, and I told him the problem, though, isn't that the world is woke. The problem is that the church is asleep. And so I want to give you a few truths today to wake you up this morning. My message is entitled, God is still. Not still as in staying motionless, but still as in he continues to do what he's always done. If he did it in the Old Testament, he's done it in the New Testament, he can do it in your life again today. If you could turn your attention to the screen, we are going to watch Ezekiel 37, 1 through 10 come to life. Come on, come on, 
Come on, the way I'm here to tell you this morning that God is still making bones into armies. Now, Pastor Beverly preached on this yesterday, so I don't want to rehash all of it, but I just want to remind you that we have the ability, anytime we read a story like this, to put ourselves in it. So either today you get to decide, are you the dead bones or are you the one calling the dead bones to life? Either way, though, there's good news because we just saw that even dead bones get a second chance when the pre presence of God is in the room. Amen? And so today I'm asking you, who are you in this story? God wants us to learn from this story that, it has, it, that nothing is too hard for him. What appears like a hopeless valley of death could actually be a field full of possibility when our Lord is on, on site. You know, I, I was thinking about this, this. A lot of people, I'm this way. Everybody, remember, you know how there's this, uh, Ellen's favorite things or something like that, Oprah's favorite things, and everybody's, you get a new car and you get a new car, right, right? You know what I'm talking about? I never wanted to be in that audience. I always wanted to be the one going, and you get a new car and you get a new car. So, so today, you get to choose. Do you want to be the dead bones or do you want to be the one calling out to the things that are dead and speaking life and commanding them to come forward? I told our young people, the problem with the church is that too many people are going to church and not being the church. And if you're bored in church, it's because you're not being the church. You can't be bored being a child of God. There's nothing boring about pulling people from hell to heaven. There's nothing boring about causing, you know, someone's life to be transformed because you told them that God loves them. Resurrect the dead and tell me that you won't want to come back and check out what's going on. Right? You're only bored if you're doing church, playing church, instead of being the church. And, and God is looking for a people, a generation. Is it you? Is it you? Is it your child? Is it your marriage? Is it someone that you know that is not only going to cause, allow their own bones to come back to life, but is going to speak to others around them and see to, see to it that life comes back into them. Some of us know how to shake the house when we rage in anger, but God is looking for people who will rattle hell with their voice, with their authority, because they know who they are in God. And is there anybody in this room that's tired of using your voice to curse? Is there anybody in this room tired of using your voice to speak death to, you know, some people, you're so busy speaking so much death that you're causing the bones. And I just wonder if you understood the power that you actually hold, what your life, what your marriage, what your job situation, what your finances would look like. Whenever the Lord speaks, things happen. When God's people preach the truth, it causes things to rattle. When we speak our truth, we can rally a crowd. But when we speak his truth, we can release captives. It's completely up to you. You get to choose today. I think sometimes we walk around earth and life and go. We, we really think God put us on this earth to wake up, go to work, you know, go home, watch a game, go to sleep, wake up, go to work, listen to her nag, go home, wake up, go to work, watch it. You know what I'm saying? That God didn't, you do not think that God sent his son to die for you, to endure the cross and everything he went through so that you could live a boring, dull life, missing out on everything that he set you on this earth to do. If you knew the God I serve, you'd never be satisfied with dead bones. If you knew the God I serve, you'd be calling out to everything that was around you, telling it to go, to grow and to be all that God meant it to be. Uh, many years ago, I was um, on a missions trip to Dearborn, Michigan, and that's the largest Muslim community in the United States. And when I say largest Muslim community, you go there and everything's written in another language, you hear the call to prayer, it's like you're in another world. 60-year-old men with 18-year-old wives, the wives have to go in the house. This is America, okay? This is Dearborn. And so we were there, we got there, I went to, I was gonna go to wash my hair, I put it in the blow dryer, and the whole house went out, and I was like, oh. I shorted out the whole house. Well, come to find out it was when, do you remember, this was decade, about 15 years ago, when the whole Northeastern board went out? Like the whole Northeast United States went out. So we were there. We, it was like being in a real missions trip. We had no running water. We had no electricity. And we were finally going to get our day to go out and reach out to the, the Muslims in the community. And we start to go outside and it starts to rain. If you know me, I can handle not eating, I can handle not sleeping, but you put me in a hot room or make me hot when I don't want to be, and then you see a whole nother side of Penny. And so I'm like walking, I'm like, 
It starts to rain. I can feel my hair frizzing. It's getting hot. And I was like, God, we did not come all this way to have everything canceled because of some electrical outage and some weather. And so it's starting to rain. I said, God, if this is your will, let it rain. But if it's not, shut up the heavens now. And the water went, okay. I'd like to be like, that's right. And I was like this. <laughs> did you say? Everybody went, <gasps> and then we kept walking. And it started to kind of rain again. And I went, I said, stop. And it went, shh. And I went, <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, you have more power in your voice than you can imagine. And I want to challenge you to not use your breath to only prophesy to dead bones, but call back the dead bones, not just in, the, in your life, but in your family, in the world, in this church. Tell me who's going to have more authority. Who's going to have more compassion? Who will have more influence with drug addicts than an ex-drug addict? Who will have more influence with someone coming out of the LGBTQ community than the one who walked through it and came out by the power of God? I'm telling you, God is looking for people who are ready to rise up, but also who are ready to call out. He sent Moses back into Egypt to set captives free. He sent Paul, a former Pharisee, back to open the eyes of the blind because Paul knew what it was like to be blind. Don't discount yourself because all you can see is dead bones because God sees so much more. The world is calling people to come out of the closet, but God is calling his church to go back into the closet, into the prayer closet. I'm telling you, if you take some time away from TikTok and stop watching that game and stop playing that game and stop looking at that novella, we might get something done, church. Yeah, uh oh, I wasn't supposed to talk about that. Don't talk about that. The thing is, he asked them, can these dry, bone li dry bones live? When God asks you a question, he's not asking you. God gives us tests, but not to fail. He gives us tests to assess where we are. He was asking him a question that he already knew the answer to. He was wanting to see if Ezekiel knew the answer. God's wanting to see if you know the answer. Can he? Will he? Could he? Absolutely. I told the ladies, I never doubt what God can do. What I doubt is, can he do it through me? Can you understand? I know he can raise the dead, but can he do it through me? I know he can change the world, but can he do it with me? I know he can transform lives, but could he use me? And God is saying today resoundingly, yes. In case you don't know what the answer is to the question he's asking, the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the answer to everything. If you have a problem in your marriage, the answer is Jesus. You have struggles in your finances and in your health, the answer is Jesus. If you're battling addiction, the answer is Jesus. If you have a stain in your carpet, the answer is Jesus, because he knows how to get those out too. That's what he says. He washes things white, right? I threw this one in. I have this one written down because it's important to me. If you don't know the answer to MC squared divided by 1.3 million, the answer is Jesus, because that's demonic. Do I have any math teachers in the room? Any math teachers? Anybody that loves math? We will be doing deliverance after service. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm like, math, that's a dirty four-letter word. When you step into a situation, man, God is not looking for you to assess it. He's looking for you to do some damage in the kingdom of darkness. He doesn't need you to be a thermometer. He wants you to be a thermostat, right? A thermometer comes in and goes, it's hot. A, a thermometer comes in and goes, this place is not friendly. A thermometer comes in and goes, you know, I wish they would, they should, they, that, they, the other. But a thermostat comes in and goes, hmm, I think we could use a little bit more cool air. Boom. There's a difference between saying and, 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 and anybody can tell you your, your problems in your marriage. But who's going to be there to help you fix them? Oh, I gave you the answer. Jesus! And anybody else that loves him. Has it ever dawned on you that God has purposely set you in the middle of death so you could speak life to it? I mean, he took Ezekiel there. He led him there. You're praying, God, use me. And then he puts you in a job you can't stand anybody. And so then you start going like, I'm just so persecuted. I'm so, I'm so attacked. I'm, I'm triggered, Jesus. And he says, I put you there so you could pull the trigger on the enemy. I put you there so that you could be the weapon in my hand to divide what is right and what is not right and bring life where there was death. There's a vast army waiting for us to call them out. If we're not going to speak life, who will? Who will? 
Who will? If you're not going to bless your children, who will? If you're not going to be kind to your spouse, who will? If you're not going to be thankful for your teachers or your boss or your job, who will? If you're not going to push away from the cookies, who will? And I'm saying that after I did not push away from one cookie this conference. I, I, you know, Pastor Beverly, she is very outgoing and outspoken. I shut her up just because she was like, this girl's eating a lot of cookies. Yes, I am. She was like this. I did. I told her I am not on, on break from nothing this conference. I'm going to eat everything. Put it in front of me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. God doesn't speak through you until he can first speak to you. And if he can't tell you something without you getting offended. But I, I already know what y'all are thinking. God can speak to me. He can tell me anything he wants. Except he says it through your wife. He says it through your leader. He says it through Pastor Marco. He says it through the homeless person who calls you stingy when you're walking by. See what I'm saying? Have you ever felt like that? Like, I think I know what Satan's voice sounds like. It sounds just like my husband. Not me, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa. You didn't hear that. Right? You can speak God's, you can't speak God's word if you don't know God's word. And we are commanded to speak his word. If you will say what he says, you will see what he says. But you better be careful with that. Because we spend sometimes too much time talking about the grave than we do talking about our God. You know, we all know somebody would be like, ooh, look at these bones. Ooh, what did they do? That's some ugly bones. Why are their bones like that? You know what I'm saying, right? If I had been here, I wouldn't have left myself laying out like that. I would have at least died like this. <laughs> There's always somebody talking about the grave. But who's going to be talking about their God? <laughs> right? I'm sorry. I can't. I don't have time. <laughs> Just keep me on track. I read this quote. I thought it was so good. We are giving the world an explanation, but they are starving for a demonstration. Come on. Anybody willing to say, God, use me. We are, we, we are so powerful, more than we realize, that we forget that the Spirit hears even the quietest prophecy that we speak, even the, the whispers of the heart. The issue is many of us are prophesying dead bones and quiet tones, and we think that nobody knows. I'll give you an example. You're looking at your wife, and she's like, chah, chah, chah. a few of them do like, you know that? And you didn't do this, and you didn't do that, and you didn't do this. And in your mind, you're like this, dead bones. And she goes, what was that? I said, dead bones, girl, your cheeks are looking good. Is that contour is working? And then you wonder why you have. You done called her dead bones to her face, to your mom, to your friends, to yourself. You're prophesying dead bones, dead bones, dead bones. And then you think because it's in quiet tones, but the end. The enemy's got ears, and you've got life or death in your tongue. So it doesn't matter if you go, dead bones, or if you go, dead bones. They still hear. You can't prophesy dead bones in the dark of night and expect a mighty army in the light of day. It just doesn't happen. I, I told Pastor Marco that God really gave me a word, and, and, and I'll let him share that with you if he feels like it's from God in, in the longer sense. But I really do feel like this is a season for the way that he's going to use you guys to call back prodigals that were in this house. And, and he can say whatever he feels like he wants to say about that. God took something that was once alive and he is now bringing it back from the dead and he can do the same for you. God is still wanting to use you either by raising you back to life or using your voice to do that for someone else. The next thing is this, that God is still turning water into wine. I want to read this passage in John 2. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And I have to, I, I, I was already starting to giggle, like, because I know what I'm about to tell y'all. I think the Bible's awesome. 
It's powerful. It's life-giving. But it's funny, too. It was funny, too. Okay. Did you hear what he said? She's, he's like, woman, why are you bothering me, right? And she's like, do whatever he said. So why? That doesn't make sense. It's like if there's a couple of sentences left out. So this is my interpretation of how I think that conversation probably happened. I think it was more like this. Yeah, ¿por qué me estás molestando? And I think, like a mom, she went, ¿cómo que vieja? Now, I don't speak Spanish, but I Googled that. And so she goes, ¿cómo que vieja? And I think that whatever happened in between was the mom look. You know what I'm talking about, right? She, he's like, why are you bothering me? I'm at the party, mom. And then she was like. You know that look was like, when I tell you to do something, you don't ask questions. Jesus was a saint, but Mary, she had to have some kind of strength to, you know, to like raise up a savior. And I think she, was, she gave him that look and he went. And then she goes, do what he tells you. See what I'm saying? You see it now? Do you see it now? It didn't make sense before, but I just clarified the spirit told me. God, please don't send me to hell over a joke like that. That's funny to me, though. For real, that's funny to me. Verse 6, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best for last. Oh, could I submit to you that maybe you guys are the best that was saved for last? You're asking yourself, God, why am I alive in this time? Why am I having to go through this pandemic? Why am my children having to battle all this craziness in their schools? Maybe, just maybe, God saved the best for last. I, don't, I am not worried about this generation. You want to know why this generation is being so beat up about their identity? Because the devil's so stinking afraid once they realize who they are what's going to happen I'm telling you what do, do not when we have our kids our school back to school prayer at our church we never pray I Jesus I take care of me don't let no demons come around him even though everybody thinks he's the demon but okay no protect him Lord and Jesus and keep him from the bad people now we don't do that this is what we pray God, make our kids dangerous to darkness. Send them into the schools. Set it on fire for Jesus. Don't let them be afraid. Let them walk in boldness. Let them walk in courage. Let them know the word. Let them raise the dead. If you are raising your child, I told the mamas, and I'm going to tell you daddies too, because somebody's got to lead this house. And if mama's leading it wrong, somebody needs to step up. If mama is leading them to be a uh, cuckoo of everything and everything, <laughs> Somebody needs to stand up and say, that will not happen in my house. As for me and my house, we will not serve fear. We will serve the Lord. Thank you very much. Oh, man. I am so sorry. Y'all going to be having so many counseling sessions after this. I'm going to be like, well, I told her. What's wrong? He's in the hospital because he tried to tell me. I told my wife, you are not going to be. Don't be blaming me. Don't be blaming me. Before I get into the whole miracle of what just happened, though, I want to say this. Notice verse 9, how it says that the master of the banquet tasted the water, but he didn't know what, why he had turned to wine. Like, he didn't know where it came from, but it says the servants did. Come on, there's a whole message in that. There's a whole message. You want to know why it's not good enough just to come to the church? Because you're supposed to be the church. And part of being the church means you work and do the stuff that needs to be done. So if you've been coming, can I just say this? And if they don't like it, they don't have to invite me back. I'm sorry. But if you've been coming here already two years and you're not serving somewhere, something's up with your heart. Because you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't be driving somebody around in your car for two years if they never offered to pay gas. You wouldn't be... I, like, come on, you know what I'm saying? And here's the reason why it matters. Because it's the servants who saw the miracle firsthand. Everybody else tasted it. But they were right there watching what he did. And by the way, some of those people in the room went on to be the disciples who go and do the same things he did. So yeah, sometimes the best miracles happen in the nursery. Sometimes the best miracles happen when they're ushering or when you're behind the scenes and the sound, when you're doing the media and the PowerPoint. Are you missing service? Absolutely not. You're supposed to be spending time with Jesus on your own anyway. 
You might have missed the message, but this thing we have so Y'all got Hollywood up here. You can watch this thing on replay at 2 in the morning if you wanted to. I'm just saying, here's the problem, though. You're like, Jesus, I want to be that new wine. God, I want to do the miracles. But if you are new wine, you cannot be acting like old water. And some of you, look at there. I just, like, somebody was like, that's my husband. He's telling me he's different, but he looks the same. That's for all of us. That's for you kids, too. You want your parents to be all like, you got to be loving Jesus. You're not setting an example for me. Last time I checked, there's no junior Jesus. They got the same standards for you, too. You want your mama to clean up her heart? Start cleaning your room and praying, and you can see some breakthrough. I'm saying it goes both ways. And all the moms start running up and throwing dollars at me. <laughs> yes. New wine shouldn't look like or taste like old water. I don't even like Dr. Pepper with ice at restaurants because if it comes to me watered down, I'm sending it back. And that's the problem, isn't it? Some of you don't know if you're wine or if you're water. That's another sermon. But maybe you're here thinking, but you know what, Pastor Penny, I want God to use me. I'd love him to pour something new into my life. But I'm like that. I'm not that jar. I'm not that jar. I'm broken. Like, I tried this Jesus thing, and I'm here by just the skin of my teeth. I, I can't tell you that I love God because I know I do, but then I know that at night I'm probably still going to look at that pornography, and I hate it, and I hate the way I feel, and I'm here hoping against hope that he'll do something. I, I do love Jesus, but I'm so addicted to this thing that nobody knows about. I do love Jesus, but it hurts so bad, and sometimes it feels like cutting is the only way to fix it. I do love Jesus, but I'm broken. How could he even ever think of putting wine in? to me. Let me say one thing for cutters, by the way. I, I've worked with young people who do this. It doesn't work, and I'll prove it to you. If it works, you'd only have to cut once. But the fact that you have to do it more than once tells me it didn't work. So why don't you talk to the one who took the ultimate cut for you and be healed once and for all? So in case you're sitting here today and you're wondering, you're wondering, like, am I too broken? How is God going to put new wine in me? I want to tell you about a Japanese... Um, a, a Japanese belief, they call it wabi-sabi. And what wabi-sabi is in the Japanese culture is you can take something ugly and find something beautiful in it. They'll find, you know, if the rocks are messed up and one leaf falls, it's not perfect, but they say wabi-sabi. Out of that belief system came this idea called kintsugi. And what kintsugi is, is an old Japanese technique where they repair broken objects by filling them with gold, like there's a kind of a binding powder and, and gold dust and different uh, lacquers. And basically what they're saying is that it's actually more beautiful put back together. And they're actually, they don't even try to hide it. They want to put the brakes on display. They say that's a part of the story of this cup or this jar. And I have some pictures up here of what Kintsugi looks like. Isn't that beautiful? That means that cup was broken and they put it back together with gold. It's considered highly valuable. Except Jesus isn't putting us back together with gold. He's putting us back together with red from the blood that he shed at the cross. I'm telling you, Jesus loves broken things because he's the master builder. You know, I know for men, though, that you're like, I don't want to be pottery. <laughs> I don't want to be like a little teapot. <laughs> okay, so let me give you an example. Do you remember the show, my, one of my favorite shows growing up in the 80s? Karate Kid? Okay, do you remember how he was like, I want to look karate, and, and Mr. daniel Sun, right? Mr. Yagi, he's like, hey, well, wax on, wax off. Stand the so Daniel gets really mad, like, I've been doing all this stuff. I thought you were going to teach me the karate. You haven't shown me nothing. I'm leaving. And then here it comes, ah, 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 ah. show me. Wax the floor. But yeah, I can do the whole voice. I'm really trying hard not to because I'm short on time. But I can do the whole scene for you. So, so, <laughs> do it. So, so after a while, he goes, wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off, does the whole thing, and then he goes, all right, show it to me. And then he starts, hi, hi. And then, hi, hi, right, right? Okay, that's your kintsugi, guys. You're over here thinking, like, why God's got me doing this, and why I grew up with no father, and, and you, you expect me to be a good father? I didn't have no example. You over here want me to be a good husband? I didn't even know what it was to be a man. I'm still trying to figure it out. What do you want me to pay the bills? I don't even know how to balance a 
checkbook. I don't have a degree. And I'm telling you, if you will take every little thing that God tells you to do, even if it seems small and insignificant, even if it seems like just say I'm sorry, even if it means just showing up faithfully to the house of God or signing up for discipleship, it doesn't matter. Do it and do it faithfully because you're going to come up to a place one day where the devil's going to go, you can't, and you're going to go, ha, ha. I'm saying, I'm telling you. Mary had a desperate faith, which caused God to deliver faithfully. I'm telling you, what she did there, uh, what they did there was, this water's good, but it's not in the best form for what we need it for. Just because a leader corrects you, just because your parents tell you something you don't want to hear, just because a boss critiques you doesn't mean they don't see value. Actually, if they're willing to get in your face and tell you something you don't like at the risk of the relationship, they're saying, Kintsugi. They're saying, I see something in you, but we got to put this back together right. Because you can, yeah, hey, you can be some really pretty bones laying on the ground. You can be a nice, cold, fresh cup of water. But this is a party going on, and we're needing some wine in this place. We need something that's going to change the atmosphere of this room. Will you step up to the plate? Discipleship is allowing somebody to speak into your life and agreeing to not get offended by it. Some of you need to sign up for discipleship. If you don't know how to be a good husband, there are a lot of good husbands you can follow. But you have to humble yourself to do it. You don't know how to get out of depression. There are a lot of upbeat people that you can follow. I think there is a real thing, a real thing called clinical depression. But I'm going to tell you this. A lot more of it is just a lot of people talking negative. A lot of people just agreeing with the devil on a feeling. And we were never called to follow feelings. We were called to follow Christ. Amen? I told the, I told the ladies... Jesus didn't come to give a diagnosis. He came to deliver you. So quit giving people diagnosis when God says they can be delivered of something. And the last thing is this, that God is still giving beauty for ashes. I'm going to read this verse in Isaiah. It says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news of tidings to the poor. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. Uh, if I could have my lovely assistant. Here's why this passage in particular matters. Because when we hear that, this is the picture we get. Let's, we're going to use the water to wine, but beauty to ashes, okay? Let's pretend like this is everything you've ever done wrong. This, this is your mess ups. These are your heartaches. These are the things done wrong to you. This is where you've fallen short. These are your secret sins. These are the things you try to hide. This is all the junk that, that happened in your childhood. And you're, you're looking at this and you go, he's going to give me beauty for ashes. And so you come to church and you pray your prayer and what you're hoping is he'll do this. Yeah! Right? Takes the water, gives you the wine. Except that's not exactly the picture we need to have in our eyes, in our mind. Because this says he's completely removing. If you were raped, now you're not raped. That's not what God says. If you were abandoned as a child, now your dad's going to come back. He might not. You had an abortion. Is the baby going to come back? Maybe not. And so then what happens is you go home and you start to realize, I'm still stuck with this sadness. My baby's still not alive. My marriage didn't get better. I'm still struggling with my health. I prayed and my mama still died. I want to stop, but I still have the urges. I hate the urges and I still have them. And we get mad at God and we walk away and say, he didn't do it. You didn't do it. But I'm telling you, the better picture is that beauty for ashes is not a transaction. Okay? Sorry, I'm going back and forth. Sorry. Beauty for ashes is about a transformation. It's about saying, I'm not going to fix things the way you think. I'm going to take what you think is broken and ugly. I'm going to take what you think is wasted, what is nothing, and I'm going to turn that into something. What he's saying is, I'm not going to give you beauty in exchange for the ashes. He says, I'm going to give you beauty in the ashes, out of the ashes. The ashes will become what is beautiful to you. Thank you.
I think that's amazing. Well, the problem is that we want to opt out, but God wants us to overcome. We want to avoid, but God wants us to advance. We want to forget, but God wants us to forge a new path. We want to escape calamity, but God wants us to experience Christ. We want everything to be done and rescued from everything, and God wants to resurrect us. We sing the song, Jesus, make new wine out of me. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you've given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. But we really mean Jesus, bring new wine to me. We don't want to be the thing that he brings it out of. So I'm going to tell you my story as quickly as I can. I know in, as Christians, we don't believe that God makes mistakes, right? But the fact is that people do. And I was a mistake. I was not a planned baby. My mom was a young woman who got swept off her feet by a 35-year-old divorced man and, and ended up getting pregnant with me. And she was going to tell him she was pregnant with me when he got back from working out of town, except he was already engaged to somebody else. So he was playing her on the side the whole time, and she didn't know. And maybe that's not a big deal now. It seems like it happens all the time. But in the 70s, that was very weird to be a single pregnant mom. And my mom was not the kind of woman who she didn't do drugs, she didn't party, she didn't sleep around, nothing like that. It was just one of those things where you move to a new town and you just get fooled. So I grew up in the 70s not knowing who my dad was, even though he lived across town. And I didn't really know too much of the difference of it, I guess, until I went to school. And then they started asking you stuff like, what's your name? Who's your mom and dad? I didn't know how to answer that. So you see me now as outgoing and strong. People know I'm opinionated and I'm outspoken and I'm goofy. I get it. But I was a little kid at some point. And around five or six years old, they made us write letters in school. And the letters we would have to write to dad. Or, this was back before email, right? You had to actually write a letter and put a stamp. And we would have to write to our parents or to Santa Claus. And I wrote a letter. This shows you my mindset at this age, first grade. Dear daddy, can I please meet you? I've been a good girl. I make good grades. I, it, it, it's like this letter said that as a little six-year-old or seven-year-old, I thought I, I was the problem. And uh, so I grew up. And around seven years old, I finally got to meet him. And between the ages of 7 and 11, I spent time around him and his family. I was scared. I was excited. I was nervous. Except the problem is between the ages of 7 and 11, he touched me in ways that fathers are not supposed to touch their daughters. But I didn't tell anybody. Because to be honest, can I be really honest? I didn't know if it was okay. I just knew it didn't feel okay. Like, I, he, they made me feel like I was, like, wrong because I was being raised by a single mom. He would sit me on his lap and he would tell me things like, you know, Penny, you need to listen to me because if you don't, you could end up a prostitute because girls who don't have fathers in the home, but he never addressed the fact that he was the reason I didn't have a father in the home. I was starting to figure out what these things meant. He made everything seem dirty. I started wetting the bed. I was seven, eight years old, and I remember, this just shows you how young I was. I wet the bed, and then I rolled my brother onto the pee, thinking they wouldn't figure out it was me. I went to listen outside the door to make sure they didn't hear me changing my clothes, and the story got back to my mom that I was listening outside the door to see if they were having sex. I didn't even know what that was. But on the outside, I was normal. Attitude, probably, I'm sure, like any kid, but I was normal. Junior high, by, by 11 year old, I told my mom I didn't want to see him anymore, but I didn't tell her why. My mom married my stepdad. He was amazing. He's still amazing. He's my dad, my kid's popo. He's awesome. But how many of you know that that doesn't erase what happened? And I got stories of other people. Between 11 and junior high, I was normal. I was outgoing, cheerleader, drama, sports. I was in basketball. I'm like five foot two and a half. Anyway, hold on another story. I was in basketball. I was in everything. You would have never, if you were a teacher, called me an at-risk kid. But I was. On the inside, I was starting to get suicidal. I hated my life. I hated my mom. I was angry at the world. Even though it wasn't her fault, I was just angry. To make matters worse, my biological dad's wife worked at the school in a program that I had to walk by the building. She was there when several of these things happened. That's why I didn't know if it was okay, because two adults were in the room, and I didn't know if it was okay or wrong or what. Between eighth grade and ninth grade year, my older cousin introduced me to my first beer, and my first beer became many, many beers and many, many mistakes with many, many people. I hated myself, but on the outside, I was a good kid. And around 18 or 19 years old, I finally surrendered my life to Jesus. I couldn't believe that he loved me and saw something indifferent in, in me that I saw in myself. And I'm telling you this, I got so much more to tell you, but I wanted to tell you this for this reason. Because the fact is that, that I ended up meeting someone, my best friend for three years. We got married. We just celebrated 28 years of marriage. We didn't have sex until after we were married. I was such a transformed person. I'm telling you that because you need to know you can be one way before Jesus and another way after. I had kids after I was married. And I'm a pastor today instead of a prostitute because of what Jesus did in my life.
But here's the clincher of it all. Because we're talking about beauty for ashes, okay? We're talking about beauty for ashes. I ended up, fast forward, I'm a pastor. A, a lady comes to me and she says, Pastor, I'm a school district nurse. I'm going to go speak in all these schools. But I'm going to go to this one school. I'm going to be talking about sex and STDs and blah, blah, blah. You're good with kids. Can you inspire them? Just 10 minutes. I said, sure. I show up. They said, oh, she's in the hospital with open heart surgery. Can you speak for a whole hour? I was like, uh, okay. And then can you do that six times? Do you want me to speak for basically six and a half, seven straight hours? I mean, lunch and straight hours? Yes. On the fly, I had to think of something to say to kids in a public school, and I couldn't mention Jesus or God. But I had to talk biblical principle because I wasn't going to leave that whether they liked it or not. So I told my story. That's all I could think of. I told my story of what ha happened and how God changed me. And, and they had such a response. They invited me to another school and to another school and another school. Next thing you knew, I was speaking in the entire school district to every grade level, sixth, seventh, and eighth in junior high and some high schools. I was speaking in colleges, and this was outside of pastoring. But here's the clincher. It wasn't too long after it about, this is about, about 10, 11 years now, about four or five years into it. I was just doing it for free. Whenever they asked me, I would build teams. They were coming to me. Can you get people? I'm like, I'll bring you speakers. I would call every youth pastor I knew, every pastor I knew. I had nothing but Holy Ghost filled team of people going in, speaking biblical principles on self-esteem and sex and you name it. And they came to me one day and said, Is somebody, are we paying you? I said, no. You know what? We need to. What's a good amount? I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, how much does, I'm like, okay. If you feel like it. Let's just say that's only gone up since then. During the pandemic, I couldn't go speak in person, so they had me speaking on video to kids. I had parents calling me saying, I walked past my kid's room and I could not stop. I couldn't walk away. I had to sit and listen to your whole thing through the video screen. And they paid me more to do it while I sat in there with my pajamas from the waist down talking about Jesus. This year, I had teachers calling me in, just come tell us about God and tell us how to stand against fear and COVID. I'm like, okay. I've had schools call me in because girls are cutting themselves and demons are literally controlling them. Six men, four men couldn't hold a girl down. Why did that happen? Because I'm so cute. That is obviously one of your thoughts, I'm sure. But it's not. Is it because I'm a great speaker? No, there's a lot of people who speak way better than me. It's because I was molested. It's because I wasn't wanted by my father. It's because I grew up feeling lonely and depressed and suicidal and had a smile on my face the whole time. It's because I made stupid mistakes blaming everybody from God to my father to my mother to everybody until the day I realized I had one choice, live or die, and Jesus said I could live, and I chose it. And as a result, beauty came from ashes and some money. Stand with me. Stand with me, please. We're going to make this quick. I need, if you are a prayer partner, prayer team, come on up. There's no time to waste. We have another service getting to come. This is your moment. If there was a drum beating, it would be going boom, 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 boom. You need to know that God wants to set you free. But you cannot get free and you cannot experience liberty and deliverance until you first come to his son, Jesus Christ, in faith. So you got to do it his way, but if you'll do it his way, he'll transform your way. I'm telling you today, the best and first decision you need to make, if you haven't already made it, is to give your life to Jesus. If you're in this room and you're ready to do that, come, come. And I'm speaking, I'm going to say this specifically to men. I want you to come if you have not given your life to Jesus, because you're our leaders, you're our fathers, you're the husbands, you're the ones who are going to transform entire generational lines. Come, if you have not surrendered to Jesus, I'm not asking you to be religious. I'm not asking you to give money to the church. I'm asking you to give your whole life to Christ. Just come. Come, if you need Jesus, if you're struggling with identity issues, you can't positive think yourself out of that. You have to deliver. You have to be delivered through faith in Jesus Christ. And here's the second altar call. Look, I heard Pastor Robert say this. If you don't feel like you can walk up to the front right now, or maybe right now you're not ready and you go home later and you start thinking about it and God does something, you can always reach out to igotsaved.com, right? And let them know. They'll find you. Please come up here. We've got people ready to pray for you. But the second altar call is this. If you're ready to be used to shake up hell with your voice, if you're ready to let God rattle some bones in your life, 
If you're ready for God to turn water into wine and beauty into ashes and to use you in spite of feeling broken, you come. You come because we want to pray with you. We want to pray with you and see you walk out victorious. One day I was speaking and I was telling the story of what happened to me at a youth thing and a bunch of kids came forward, a bunch of guys. And then I said, I feel like God is saying that there are some men in this room, some guys in this room who you've been molested, but you don't want to tell anybody because you're afraid they'll, they'll call you a name or, or laugh at you. And I said that and all these boys started heaving and crying. And I'm saying it again to you today. If you're in this room and you need healing, just come. Because God doesn't want you to carry that the rest of your life. I was able to leave that event and tell my mom, don't ever feel bad that you didn't know. Don't ever feel bad that you didn't see it. Because what the devil meant for bad, God turned around for my good and for the good of many. Everything that was meant for bad, everything that you experienced that was bad, God will transform. Surrender it to him today. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand what we receive today. How many received that word that God takes all of our pain, our hurt? And I love that picture of putting gold in there, but you know what God does? He puts himself in you to repair you. His DNA, his love, his power, his wisdom. And there's no one here that's too broken. As a matter of fact, the more broken you are, the more of God's grace you'll receive. Okay, so God specializes in our hurt, our pain, and our brokenness. Let's receive it. Now, let's receive the love. Let's receive the forgiveness. Let's receive the infusion of God's Spirit in us to make us what we should be. He has a plan for your life. You know, Penny never knew that God would use all that pain and she's speaking to over 10,000 teenagers every single year because of her pain. See, the enemy thought he was going to take you out. And God says, no, I'm going to turn it into a testimony for me of what I can do with someone that's broken and hurt. We're going to pray. And prayer is powerful because prayer allows God to pour into you. Without prayer, you're not given permission. Prayer gives permission. Prayer is not for him. Prayer is for you to give God permission. So when you begin to pray, you're giving God permission to come and set you free, heal you, restore you. And this is what he does. He, he now says, my plan will begin to unfold in your life. We've seen enough of the devil's plan. It's time to start seeing God's plan for your life. Come on. So let's pray. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Well, I'll even help you pray. Let's pray together. Say, Jesus, I come to you now. Save me. Forgive me. Make me new. Fill me now with your spirit, with your presence. From this day forward, I will live for you and allow your will to be done in my life. I thank you, Lord for not giving up on me, for dying on a cross for me, taking all my pain and then giving me your healing, your freedom and your purpose. I am saved. I'm born again and I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. In Jesus name, I pray, amen. Let's give a hand for everyone that's here, gave their lives to the Lord. Everyone that's here, your next step is starting at the way. Church at 1 o'clock, which is right after the service, we'll be starting in our first Spanish service. If you want to be here, that'd be great. Love to see you here. And also this weekend, Wednesday night we have service, but this weekend, October 2nd, we will be at Orange Show at 7 o'clock Saturday. And we're going to do the crusade. Love for you to be there as well. Bring somebody that needs Jesus and we'll see him get saved at the crusade your Wednesday night. Love you. God bless you. Remember, this is God's for you. There's no one can come against you. If you know someone who speaks Spanish, call them up. Bring them. 
We're going to have a Spanish service right here at the Weber Lowry in this, right here in this auditorium. God bless you. We love you.